All right, this video is to um, support students as they work through uh, chapter 20 out of the um, inquiry into biology textbook. So just a reminder that these notes uh, make no claim as my own there out of the textbook and hopefully uh, will be useful to them as they work along with the textbook. So um, this is chapter 20, population growth and interactions. We are looking at section 20-20.1 20 uh, population growth. All right, we'll get started by looking at density and distribution of populations. Um, all populations can be described in terms of two fundamental characteristics. Those characteristics are density and distribution. Um, so we've got a, a few formulas in this section that we'll look at. Um, most of them are pretty self-explanatory. We'll try to do some examples of each one um, to make sure that you know how they work. Now, the first one is the formula for population density. It is defined as the number of individual organisms, which we use the variable n to represent, um, the number of individual organisms in any given area, or volume if we're talking uh, perhaps a, a population that's in water or something like that. So the formula um, with those variables looks uh, like dp um, is equal to uh, n over a or um, n over v depending on, um, on what uh, sort of area you're looking at. Um, so just to do an example of how that, that formula works, we'll look at this one here with some uh, gophers. Um, so um, if we've got a field, um, perhaps even just outside the school, um, and we see a bunch of gophers there, we could look at a set area, um, an area of 10 meters squared. And if we observe it long enough, we see that there's 12 gophers that live there. We could determine the population density of those gophers. So if we um, do that, we would start with our formula here. And um, we've got dp is equal to n, and because we're looking at an area here, it would be um, it would be um, uh, the, the first of the formula, not the second one. So we just simply plug in our numbers. Um, our uh, n, our, our number of individual organisms, would be 12 in this case. And we are going to divide that by um, the area 10 meters squared. So very simply, we get one, uh, 12 divided by 10 is 1.2, and our units would be gophers per meter squared. Okay. Very, very simple, nothing. Nothing too uh, complicated there. Um, when we talk about uh, population distribution, um, we've got a few different options as potential um, patterns of distribution. And we'll look at uh, each of them. The three different uh, ones would be uniform, random, and clumped. So we'll give you an example of each of those. Okay, um, those examples will, will come in a, um, a moment as we work through them, uh, work through some of these factors that are going to affect those distribution patterns. Okay, so um, distribution patterns are influenced by um, several different factors. We've got both uh, biotic and uh, abiotic factors. Um, some of the main ones would be uh, the distribution of resources in a habitat, um, but then also those interactions among the members of a population or of a community. Um, Generally speaking, it's difficult for us to place um, a population exactly in one of these patterns of distribution. Um, often, uh, at different times, they would fit into different ones of these. Um, but uh, we do try to give you an, a little bit of an example. Uh, this picture here um, would be uh, a picture of um, Earth. If we could look at it from space and maybe unwind it a little bit, right? So we could see all of it. We could see that those lights um, would indicate where uh, much of the Earth's population is located uh, in in different cities. So even this um, spreading out, this is this is what we're referring to as a distribution pattern. How people spread out, how different populations spread out. So um, the first one that we would refer to is the random distribution pattern. 
Um, this one is uh, is fairly rare. Uh, generally, we'd, we'd say that things um, aren't normally that random. Often when we look deeper, we could see that, uh, that there is a, a reason for um, something happening. But um, perhaps a, a good example that, that appears somewhat random, um, you've got uh, moose. Um, with their their calves in in the um, summer they kind of go wherever they'd like if if the resources are abundant um, and and there's not a lot of them in the area they're not going to compete with each other we would say that that uh, that distribution pattern would be somewhat random you wouldn't really be able to predict it as long as there's enough resources and and um, not too many of one population that's going to uh, to cause that competition so that's the first one random distribution pattern um, the next one would be the clumped distribution pattern. Uh, this one is probably the most um, common. Well, certainly humans, we, we noticed on that first uh, or a few slides ago where all the lights are kind of clumped in certain areas, right? We, we can recognize where those big cities are. Um, many other populations, similar idea. Um, here's a, a picture of a bunch of birds. Um, it's, it's probably more rare to see just uh, one bird um, on its own, often they'd be in clumps, and that that's the case with many um, many different populations. The reason being is that uh, generally um, uh, groups would choose their habitat due to proximity of food, water, shelter, um, those types of things, and, and often then they would clump together in those regions. So that would be an example of clumped distribution. And the third one would be uniform distribution. This one's uh, probably a little more artificial um, in, in nature. This wouldn't happen as as uh, as often. I suppose you could say um, when when you've got uh, species that act very territorial, that's um, that's somewhat uniform distribution. Each each uh, um, animal would have the uh, the certain uh, radius or whatever that would be its territory, and and if you plotted that out, it might look fairly uniform. Um, but probably uh, the best example of this would be in agriculture. So you've got um, an orchard here, and we evenly plant the trees um, so that they're not uh, too close to each other, but we want to get as as many as we can in. Um, same thing with planting uh, a field of. of uh, any type of grain or something like that, we would choose the, the distance the plants are away from each other, and um, that's going to be a very uniform distribution pattern. So those are your three different distribution patterns, the, um, the random, the clumped, and then the uniform. Okay, next thing we'll discuss is uh, the idea of population growth. So um, population growth is... Uh, well, any population size directly depends on um, on a few factors, actually four factors that w could change the size. Um, we've got a couple that are going to increase the size. That would be the, the births, the new births. Also immigration, what we mean by immigration is new, um, uh, new organisms uh, coming into a um, specific location. Um, and then uh, factors that would cause the... Um, the population size to um, decrease would be deaths and emigration, which would be um, uh, population leaving a specific area. So I guess they would be counted then as um, as immigrants to wherever they're leaving. So um, in a specific region, though, we've got uh, births and immigration adding to a population size and then deaths and emigration uh, leaving. And we could um, express this mathematically with this equation with... Um, Obviously, uh, B representing births, I emigration, um, D deaths, and E emigration. Okay, so it's it's not only um, how large a population gets that is important. We would also look at the um, the rate of that um, that population increase or decrease. So um, the uh, speed is is also important. So. Um, when we have a, a really um, quick increase, uh, we would refer to that as a population explosion. And there'd be lots of different reasons uh, why that might happen. Um, and then a decrease, but that's very quick. Uh, we would, on the other hand, call that a population crash. And so you could think of um, if there's a disease or something, then that um, would, would potentially cause a population crash. 
Um, now we, we've got a formula for this as well that we use. Uh, the change in the number of individuals in a population, so delta, and that's the, the Greek letter delta, which means change in um, over a specific time frame. Um, the change in time there, delta t, is known as the population's growth rate, and we use gr for the growth rate. So just an example of how we can use this uh, formula. This example is out of, out of your textbook. In January 1997, the population of Banff Springs snails um, in the lower cave at Basin Springs in Banff National Park uh, was 3,800. Um, uh, two years later, it was down to 1,800. So uh, if we were to find the growth rate here, we would use um, this formula. Growth rate is equal to delta N over delta T. And delta always refers to the final minus the initial. So if we looked at what the final was, or the the, um, the second one that's given to us there, uh, two years later, it was 1,800. That's what we'd start with, 1,800. And that's always minus the initial where we started looking at it, and that total was 3,800. Our delta T, it says, was over a course of two years. And um, so when we do the math on that, 1,800 minus 3,800 is negative 2,800 divided by two years. So we have a total of negative 1,400. And our units would be snails per so notice that that's a negative um, value. That negative is going to give us the hint um, that it is a negative growth rate would mean that the population is decreasing, and that's clear from the question as well. Okay. All right, um, so it, it's difficult sometimes to compare our, our growth rates. Um, in the previous example, we are looking at a snail um, a snail population that's about 3,000 or, or, or whatever, but we could also um, talk about populations that are either much larger than that or much smaller than that, or obviously the size of the population is going to affect the growth rate as well. So if we were to compare populations, um, a better way to do that would be to use the per capita growth rate, the, the CGR. And that can be determined by calculating the change in the number of individuals, again, delta N, relative um, to that total uh, original number of individuals, or just N. Um, then when we divide this change in the, uh, in the number by the original number, um, we get a formula that looks like this. So again, we can do an example here to show you um, how you might use this equation. Okay, so if we've got a small town of about a thousand people, in one year there are 50 births, 30 deaths, um, and uh, no immigration or emigration. Okay, so if we were to find the um, per capita growth rate there, uh, we would um, approach it like this. Um, CGR is our formula. That is equal to delta N over our original n, so our delta n, the factors, um, or the, the things that contributed to this change in uh, numbers uh, would be the births. Okay, so births is going to count as a plus, right? We're adding, so 50, and then we would add to that to the um, deaths, which is gonna count as a negative, so 50 plus a negative 30, or essentially 50 minus 30. We're gonna divide that by our total original number, which was 1,000. When we do that, we come up with um, uh, 20 over 1,000, or uh, 0 0.02 would be the per capita um, growth rate. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, some of these um, these things we've talked about the population growth. There's certain factors that are going to affect it. Um, some of these factors are, again, both biotic um, and abiotic, so um, we'll explain some of uh, both of those. So the first one we'll look at is uh, the biotic potential of a species. This concept is um, that 
uh, each species has an intrinsic rate of growth that is possible. Um, so this would be if given unlimited resources, um, ideal living conditions, so we're, we're taking away the predators, we're giving them as much, uh, as much food, nutrients um, as it, as it uh, could possibly use, um, and the highest possible per capita growth rate then, right? there'd still be a limit on that, that, that um, uh, highest possible one we refer to as the biotic potential, and we use the letter R to represent that. Um, some factors that would determine this would be um, the number of offspring per reproductive cycle. So, for example, uh, we'll use this picture of the fly. Uh, for that, um, per reproductive cycle, we get many, many um, offspring for a fly. As opposed to uh, humans where we get one, maybe, maybe we have twins, right? Um, but uh, much smaller amounts. And so, obviously, the biotic potential is going to be much higher for flies compared to humans. Um, the second factor would be the, uh, the number of offspring that survive long enough to reproduce. So uh, for this one, um, uh, the flies produce many, but not all of them would make it to an age where they'd be able to reproduce themselves. Uh, probably the percentage of that would be much larger in humans. But again, since the flies are producing so many to start with, there's still going to be many more that make it long enough to reproduce. So again, uh, the fly's biotic potential is going to be much higher than a human's. Um, then the age of reproductive maturity, number of times individuals reproduce in a lifespan. So for humans, uh, we're, we're looking at getting into the, um, the mid to late teenage years anyways for reproductive maturity. Um, and, and then there's a set limit kind of on, uh, especially for females, on the um, number of times that they could reproduce as well. Compare that again to a, a life cycle of a fly, which is significantly shorter, and it and it takes a much uh, less time to get to that age of reproductive maturity, and um, then the the number of times that it's able to reproduce in a lifespan um, is also going to be one of those factors for the biotic potential, and then finally the lifespan of individuals. So if you um, only only live. Uh, be a few weeks like some of these flies uh, would then then there's um, uh, uh, potentially that's going to influence the biotic potential of a species so all those factors combine to be able to determine what the biotic potential is um, given unlimited resources and ideal living conditions uh, how how fast that rate of growth would be okay um, so uh, if a population is growing at this biotic potential and we graphed it out, um, the, the growth would be uh, exponential. We'd call it an exponential growth pattern. Um, we, we start off a little lower, right, because there's a small population to start with. But if we trace this um, very quickly, it starts going up at an exponential pattern. And we would um, describe that as a J-shaped curve. You could see that's that's kind of the shape of it, right? A J, how you'd start a J. So um, we refer to that as a J-shaped curve if it's following the exponential growth pattern um, of the um, biotic potential. Okay, um, the reality is, though, that uh, eventually um, it comes out of this uh, growing at that biotic potential. There are um, limits. Eventually there's competition and it's going to start leveling off. Okay? So um, we uh, look at this graph here and we point out a few, a few things. Initially here we've got what is called the lag phase. Um, during this time the growth is small and that's because we started off with just uh, a few individuals of a population and so um, it, it's going to take a little bit to get that population large enough to be able to, to increase at a faster amount. Then um, we, we enter this J phase right um, that we've mentioned previously that's when it's growing at its biotic potential. Um, exponentially going up. Now eventually competition for resources, other limiting factors are going to slow the rate of growth, growth down um, until it reaches what we refer to as the stationary phase and you can see that the rate of um, growth there has leveled off. Okay, At that point we would say that the birth rate and the death rate are equivalent and it's going to stay pretty level. So um, we refer to this um, type of uh, growth chart or or growth graph here as the um, the S-shaped curve um, called the logistic 
uh, growth pattern because uh, this is in reality what most populations undergo. Um, the point where it levels off here, we can see, I guess, coming back to that S, it, it looks a little bit like an S when you draw it out, right? Um, as opposed to the J that we had in the previous example. Um, the, the point where it levels off here, we would refer to this as the carrying capacity, and we give that the letter um, K. And uh, the carrying capacity is that theoretical maximum population size that the environments can sustain over an extended period of time. So um, with uh, taking into account the realities of, of limited food supplies, of predators, um, of that all, all those sorts of things, um, what is the maximum uh, carrying capacity of a um, of a a population um, or uh, of the environment for a population? So uh, that's where you'd expect it to level off. Okay. Now the the previous graph was very idealized, right? In reality, um, this carrying capacity doesn't always remain perfectly constant, and you can see from this graph here, this is probably more realistic. Um, uh, populations growing according to their biotic potential that, that J-shaped um, would keep going until they notice that oh, okay it can't and so there'd be a little bit of overshoot first and then and then some would die off and maybe they'd go underneath and then you, I just see that it kind of goes back and forth. Now other things that would affect that would also be um, um, be things just from season to season or year to year um, right maybe maybe um, food supplies are, are better in some seasons than others um, overall however though you'll notice that it does still remain fairly close to that uh, that k that carrying capacity it's going to fluctuate around that um, and we would call that a stable equilibrium uh, when it when it does that okay. um, there's certain factors that limit the habitat's carrying capacity um, and we categorize those as density dependent or density independent. So density dependent factors would be biotic. Um, they th include things like parasites, um, diseases uh, that spread easily um, when there's dense populations, right? Um, also predation. So if, uh, if a population has certain predators, that's going to um, affect the density. So that'd be density dependent factors, those biotic ones. Uh, then we've also got abiotic ones, which we refer to as density independent factors. Those would include things like harsh weather, drought, floods, forest fires, those types of things. Um, the combined effects of both these um, density dependent and density independent factors, uh, we refer to that as the environmental resistance to population growth. Okay. All right, um, the last part of this uh, section looks at life strategies. Uh, we classify um, life strategies according to these um, these previous two uh, concepts that we looked at, the, um, uh, the biotic potential, but then also the carrying capacity. And we, we try to classify them um, according to uh, which life strategy different uh, organisms seem to employ. So. Um, bacteria and other species that reproduce very close to their biotic potential, so following that R-shaped um, uh, or that J-shaped uh, exponential growth, um, we, we would refer to those as um, uh, those species employing R-selected strategies. Um, so species that do this would include, or it would be species that would have uh, short lifespans. Um, Early reproductive ages, uh, they would have large broods of offspring, and generally those offspring would receive little or no parental care. Uh, basically, their um, their way of, of approaching things is to take advantage of those favorable environmental conditions. So when the time is right, they reproduce very quickly, and that way they can uh, increase their population very quickly. So here's a, a picture of an, another R-selected type species um, uh, fish minnows, right? Uh, many are um, are uh, are produced. Um, generally, very little or no parental care, um, but the population can grow very quickly um, in these types of species. Um, the other end of that continuum continuum are populations that would employ uh, more. Um, the, the strategy of living close to that carrying capacity. So um, they would be called 
the K selected strategies, living close to that K, that uh, carrying capacity. Uh, generally, these species would have few offspring per re reproductive cycle. Um, one or both parents would, uh, would care for the offspring uh, when they're young. Um, and generally, they would take a, a relatively long time to mature and reach that reproductive age. Um, and their lifespans would generally be a little longer than the R-selected type species as well. Uh, so, um, for example, we've got these bears that uh, that would certainly fit that that uh, that type, um, employing the K-selected strategies. So, uh, one of the reasons why ecologists would um, would concern themselves with uh, with kind of classifying species as K selected or R selected is potentially they could use this to um, to predict the success of a population in a particular habitat. So if they see a new uh, new species entering a new habitat, they would be able to predict perhaps um, knowing some things about the way that they would generally reproduce. Um, they'd be able to predict how successful they're they're going to be. Um, also of note is is that um, this is somewhat of a, a relative scale, right? Um, some species we would we would classify as K selected or as R selected, but when we compare them to others that are more K selected or less uh, or or more R selected, right? We we end up with a, a continuum. So it's not that it's an either or. It's it's going to be a range in between these. So I hope that is helpful as you work through this section. Um, and certainly, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Made with DoodleCast Pro.